Hello, my name is Maroon Bixson, and I want to thank the conference organizers for the opportunity to speak to you today about Can Neuromodulation Make Us Better, uh, which deals with using neuromodulation devices um, to try and improve performance. These are my uh, disclosures, uh, as well as uh, acknowledging sources of support. And um, all these slides, uh, as well as the associated links to references, uh, will be online um, at my Twitter account. So as a basic introduction to neuromodulation technologies, uh, they take many different forms and they have many different names. The names usually tell you how the energy from the neuromodulation device is delivered into the body. So a deep brain stimulator will work by drilling a hole in the skull and implanting an electrode uh, to apply energy deep in the brain, while a transcranial magnetic stimulator will use induction through the skull. And transcranial electrical stimulation technologies use pads on the surface of the head to pass cur current through the skull into the brain. And broadly speaking, you can think of some of these technologies as requiring surgery, uh, some as being um, substantial enough that you would be getting treatment at a hospital setting or at a clinic, um, but some that are, are, are wearable enough, battery powered, and considered safe and tolerated enough that they could even be used at home or in a wide range of deployed settings. And so that's what I mean by this wearable category that I'm going to be focusing on. And specifically on technologies called transcranial electrical stimulation and a version of those technologies called transcranial uh, direct current stimulation. Um, and one I term that, that is used uh, to describe neuroergonomics uh, is, is this is sort of the, the neuroscience of everyday life, as well as the, the um, application of, of neurotechnology in the wild. And I, I do really like that expression. So I wanna use that as well here. So when we're talking about neuromodulation in the wild, um, at home, uh, at work, um, uh, in the car, um, we're gonna need technology that, that can really go everywhere. And so transcranial direct current stimulation can, uh, it's been uh, proposed to be used in applications as diverse as um, uh, sport. Uh, it's been used, proposed to be used not just in, in the treatment of disease, but in boosting cognitive performance or, or enhancing behavior um, in uh, otherwise um, um, healthy adults. Uh, so shown here is, is a someone um, getting stimulated uh, both with their coffee and with their with their headsets. And again, the, the emphasis here is that it, the, while, while there are many different kinds of form factors, um, these are battery powered and so inherently uh, very portable. So of course, the big question is, you know, how, how does this work? How, how does applying current through the skull to the brain change cognition or, or enhance performance? And there's th three ideas to keep in mind here. One is that across all these types of devices, they are directing energy to a particular part of the nervous system. So let's say it's the, the, the motor cortex. And when that energy gets to that part of that um, uh, brain system, it changes how that brain system works. It modulates it. So the, the, the modulation and neuromodulation, for example, maybe it, it boosts uh, functional capacity of that brain region or enhances neuroplasticity in that brain region. And then that change at the neuronal and network level then manifests as a, as, a, as, a, as a change, hopefully a targeted change in cognition and in behavior. And so people have spent decades uh, addressing and optimizing each one of these. And so what I can tell you now is that there's a very a precise answer uh, uh, to the, these three issues when it comes to how it works. And that very precise answer is it depends. It, it completely depends. And, and the reason for that, is, it, it, well, it's several fold. The first thing is that um, how well you can get energy to a particular part of the nervous system uh, will very much depend on the technology platform. Is it invasive? Uh, is it transcranial? Is it electrical? Is it ultrasound? So again, the, the first question of, of, deliver, of energy delivery is very technology dependent. Similarly, how that energy influences that section of the nervous system is also completely technology dependent. The way, for example, light, uh, when used on its own for photo neuromodulation, uh, will influence uh, a bunch of neurons is very different than how electricity 
uh, would influence that bunch of neurons. And also how direct current electricity versus alternating current electricity will influence that, that pack of neurons will also vary um, categorically. And so again, that depends on, as well. And finally, another point is that it's increasingly recognized that when we apply energy to the nervous system, how we change the nervous system depends entirely on the underlying state of the nervous system. So for example, what you're thinking or what you're doing may fundamentally, well, it changes your brain activity and therefore it in turn changes how, how um, uh, the neuromodulation affects your brain activity. So uh, I'll be talking about, you know, you know, so each of these points sort of, sort of in, in, in turn. Oh, okay. So I wanna start with this first one, which is this notion of targeting, which is something uh, I and many other people have thought a lot about specifically in the context of transcranial electrical stimulation. So this uses electrodes placed on the head. And, and for a long time, the electrodes that were used were rather large. And so what we did is we developed computational models. These are MRI derived based on individual anatomical scans. And we use these models to predict when you put pads on the head, these large pads, where does current go? And the results are represented in these false color maps where hotter colors in this case represent regions with, with more current flow um, and down to red and eventually black indicating regions that receive no current flow. Now in this particular picture here, you're not seeing a lot of black. And that's because when you put two pads, large pads across the head and pass current between them, that current will wash through most of the brain. And so um, it, it is not targeted. Transcranial electrical stimulation with large pad does not target it, but it certainly reaches the brain. Uh, it reaches the brain in a, in a meaningful quantity. Um, which regions are activated and how much current reaches them will certainly vary with where you place the electrodes. Uh, and it might be useful, therefore, in this more diffuse current flow pattern to really think about outcomes as network dependent. We didn't stimulate just the motor cortex, but a bunch of different regions uh, involved in movement or, or in planning movement. But you know, in my lab, we considered whether instead of using large pads, we might use smaller electrodes and whether there would be optimized ways to deploy them in arrays. So this led us to the uh, proposal of high definition TDCS. And first starting with computational models, we considered where the current flow would go. Um, and we suggested that using uh, certain deployments of high definition TDCS like 4X1, you could indeed be focal. And so transcranial electrical stimulation, but focal. And the reason this seemed like a big deal uh, is that this still was with a battery powered, non-invasive wearable technology. And so there were other ways to be focal, uh, but they required either um, large equipment uh, or, or even surgery. And so now you could be non-invasive and targeted, yet still have something that you could carry around. Now, there were a lot of um, questions about whether this was the case or not and whether this could be made practical or not. So what I'm just summarizing here is, is um, over a decade of work to develop the hardware, um, to demonstrate feasibility, uh, to develop optimization software, to validate the models directly. Uh, and this ultimately has led to a very large number of, of human trials using this technology, um, over 200 for a very, very wide range of indications, which brings up this opposite question of not does it work, but how could it work for so many different things, right? How could it both boost um, sports performance uh, and memory um, uh, and focus uh, and accelerate broadly learning, right? These, these seem very distinct categories. And this is something that comes up a lot in neuromodulation, but um, you know, there's a very rational answer. Um, and part of that relates to, to you know, the type of energy that we're putting in because all these outcomes are energy specific. And again, here I'm focusing specifically on direct current. So these, these electrodes that are being put on the head are being provided direct current. And so the brain is being washed in direct current. And my lab, I've spent two decades asking the question, how does direct current affect brain function? And, um, um, uh, um, and, you know, in, in a sentence, right, it, it, you know, we know the direct current as it washes through the brain will polarize neurons, especially uh, terminals like synaptic terminals, axons, uh, axonal terminals. We know that it will modulate um, how the brain processes information, input, output. And we also know that it will boost heavy and plasticity. And so 
you know, the, this is two decades of work and I've included here just, just a few references that you can consult on the topic. But um, we've also recently started to consider the fact that it might do something completely different. Um, I also wanna mention that when we talk about modulating input output or plasticity, this is ongoing brain activity. We do not de novo generate processing or plasticity. We boost what is ongoing. And this in turn explains why it can be used for so many different things. But what is this other thing? Uh, it's something that we're calling um, neurovascular modulation. And again, I will refer you to this paper for a lot of details on it, but the principles are very simple. First of all, uh, in, in, inside uh, our brain, inside, you know, inside our nervous system, it's not just neurons. Everyone knows that there's many other cell types and, and they're intricately coupled. So when we think about stimulation, we often just ignore these other cell types, but evidently they're there. And one piece of this is you can't intensely stimulate neurons without activating these mix of structures. You cannot produce plasticity without also affecting glia. You cannot dramatically change, change brain activity with also activating um, uh, a corresponding vascular response. And in fact, many functional imaging studies like that use, let's say, FNIRs or fMRI of neuromodulation have reported effects. You stimulate the brain and there is a vascular response. But while most of these studies consider the vascular response a um, epiphenomenon, epiphenomenon of stimulation, the last bit of this is we're saying, well, maybe not. What if the electrical stimulation was directly activating the vascular function and then this was affecting neurons. And so this leads to this bigger picture idea that there are many different things you might stimulate, but one of them is the blood vessel supply directly. And again, just um, pointing you to some of the work we've done recently uh, on the subject has taught us different things. One is that the, the blood vessels sort of suck up the current and redistribute it. And this creates very high electric fields across the blood brain barrier. And we also know that if you take in, a, in an animal model, uh, animals model uh, in vitro, for example, you, you have a system where the neurons are absent, you can directly show that the blood vessels respond. Okay. And, and um, so a final point, uh, which has to do with this sort of notion that modu you're modulating ongoing activity. And because of that, the effects of stimulation depend on the underlying brain state. Whether you're focused on something or not focused on something will affect how stimulation then changes your focus on it. And so, you know, the, the corollary, corollary of that is stimulation needs to be brain state specific, which leads to closed loop stimulation, measuring brain activity, and then deciding if and how to stimulate based on that brain activity in order to optimize outcomes. And I want to say this is sort of an old, new idea in the sense that it's an idea that's been around for a long time. Uh, and as a community, I think we are still working hard uh, um, to try to rigorously establish a way forward. And, and one way we try to do that is by um, collecting a very large data set uh, and making it completely open access and public. So this is a data set uh, that is from uh, 19 subjects, um, 72 hours of, of continuous data as the subjects did a, the CTT task, which is essentially a very boring computer game. As a result of that, their performance varied. They, they would lose focus uh, at times, we were monitoring EEG continuously, as well as um, EKG and OEG. And during these tasks, in an open label way, we were providing nine different types of high definition stimulation. So to three different brain regions with three different waveforms. Um, all this data is, is available at this reference here. And our point in putting it out here is one, we are currently developing our own closed loop algorithms. We're training them based on this open loop data. So training closed loop based on open loop but we're, we're hoping that by democratizing it, by giving everyone access to the same data, it will not only make our own algorithms uh, more likely to be adopted, uh, but will allow everyone else to take a shot at goal um, using this sort of comparable data set. So I'm gonna finish here and I, I wanted to thank you again for your attention and again, the um, organizers.